All of you who are not dads, would you please stand up? If you're not a dad, please stand up. Okay, now look around at everybody sitting down and give them a standing ovation. There you go. See how easy that was? See? And dads, you don't have to get up at all today. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to get up to get your own food. That's what you're going to have to do. Praise the Lord. The American culture has some neat pieces and parts. Father's Day, Mother's Day, we just had a course last month, and here we are marching on through June, and then it'll be July 4th weekend, and wow, yay, we need to slow it down a little, don't we? <laughs> Things are going fast. Today, after our first service, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, after our first service, we have baptism. After our second service, we're going to have baby dedication. We've got a few Bibles up here and uh, some certificates. It will take about four or five minutes to recognize uh, the parents, moms and dads, and, and uh, their little babies. And uh, can't wait for all the, yeah, well, all the noises of our babies. Yes, by about an hour, eh, about 45 minutes from now, they'll be really cranky. Well, no, we don't hope that they are, but they may be, and we'll have a good time with it. Very, very thankful. Today is, again, Father's Day and uh, um, an honor and privilege to preach and teach the Word of God. We're going to divert from our Galatians study. We'll be back next week in Galatians chapter number 5 with uh, uh, the end, uh, near the end of it. And uh, gosh, we're going to cover some great ground there. But this morning we're going to look at, why don't you go to Luke 15. You can see it at the top of the uh, artwork there. Hurting parents is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk uh, in our introduction for a few moments on... Maybe many of you uh, have this as a favorite uh, parable of the Lord, where you say, wow, I love that prodigal son story, how he comes back and the, and the father's waiting for him, and it's a beautiful, beautiful story. But don't forget, that parent, the father was hurting. He was hurting for quite a period of time waiting. We don't know. The Bible doesn't teach us exactly how long, but he was a hurting parent. And it, it seems to be, and it reciprocates, of course, with, to me, hurting children and hurting situations and homes and things like that, that um, there's hurting parents in a lot of different ways. You may be a hurting parent uh, because of what your children are going through. You might be a hurting parent because you a raising um, a special needs child, uh, and, and it just, it just uh, it's a little bit tough, uh, very hard. It's, it's a part of, as a shepherd, looking and seeing uh, the sheep of God's church, and we know that Christ remains the chief cornerstone and the chief shepherd of our church, and I, I look out in his stead and say, wow, there's some parents that are hurting, that have gone through some hurt, or they're not currently in a place where they're hurting, but they may go through something, and it may have something to do with their child um, walking away from the Lord or being a prodigal son or uh, maybe just saying, hey, spiritually right now, um, God things are not really the most important things. So we're going to read this passage here in a little bit and highlight just those few verses. I want to just get you thinking for a bit, as I always do. What do parents do when a growing child, someone who's still in the home growing, they're 10, 11, 12, 13. Don't forget, I mean, if you have young children, um, they don't really get difficult until they're like 20, so everything's good. It's easy, you know. No, you have a growing child, and they're growing up. And uh, yeah, there may be a few things that they're dealing with, and they may be just really good things. It may not even be a, a matter of a bunch of sin. It's just things they're dealing with, and you hurt for them because you want them to be able to have solution. You want them to have peace, maybe in the midst of conflict. You want them to have a, a, a calm in the midst of a storm. You want them to not be anxious. You don't feel like the pressure of this world. You, you want them to not go through bullying, uh, which is of not their choice, and they're going through that. So you hurt for them as parents or or then you look at a grown-up child, a child that has uh, grown up there. And, of course, we say in America that after 18, you are an adult. 
you're officially a big kid. And I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be 62 this year, and uh, there's rumors going around that I have not grown up yet. And uh, so I don't know. There's some areas in which maybe Cheryl could testify that I have grown up a little bit. It might be in just basically my physical condition. But I will say this. In a grown-up child, when they may stray a little bit spiritually, you hurt. You hurt. And I'm thinking that this morning as we even look at the next question, that sometimes we're wondering, how far do I go? Do I, let's just keep on going with it. How far do the life choices of our children, your child, ah, of our child, have to go for the hurt and wonderment to really settle in? I can take a little, and then I can take a little, and everything's okay. And then you think, well, how long is it going to go? The wonderment. How long? When does it settle in? We go, oh gosh, I hope that the next choice that my child makes is not one that defines their life for the bad for the rest of their lives. So you start thinking through, oh gosh, if I, if I could just caution them or, or warn them or, or, or something, maybe I can stop them or I can get in the middle of it or I can intervene or have, a, have an intervention and do something. You see, choice after choice after choice. What are we to do when it gets really tough? Because children make choices of life just like you do. One of the beautiful things about God is that he gives you a free will. He gives you a free will to choose whether you would like to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, to be born again. The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It goes a couple verses later and it says, if you're not born of water and born of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So would you truly say, okay, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is a free will choice. And God says, you choose. Choose me. I love the world so much that I gave my only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You confess with your mouth Jesus. You believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved, the Bible teaches. If you wonder about that, that is a free will choice. Just like your child. Just like you. Choosing whether I'll follow what the Father has for me in heaven as his child, born again believer. Or maybe I'll go against what God the Father would have for me. See, children develop in parents a, a hurt sometimes. So you're hurting as a parent over some of the things that they go through. And you're thinking, when will it ever end? Will it ever stop? Or it's stopped, and that's good. Will it start up again? You see, the prodigal son's story was a continual one. And Jesus, as he relays the story of a lost boy who became a lost man, who says, I'm going to just go and do what I'm going to do. It does have a happy ending. But not always does the hurting parent receive the blessing of a wonderful ending. Join with me. Luke chapter number 15, if you wouldn't mind. I'm going to pick it up around verse number 17. The story in the context, of course, is that Jesus has laid it out, and he's saying, hey, there's a man that had two sons, and one of them stayed home, was a great worker. The other one said, hey, I want to live my life the way I want to do it. Get me my inheritance, and I'm ready to go. So he has, and he's out there, and he's having a time. So verse number 17 says, when he came to himself, he said, how many higher servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he's already rehearsed what he's going to do. He's thought it through. He, he there's no context in here where it says that he's thinking, oh, my dad must be suffering. My dad must be going through tough times. My dad's having an awful time. I, God, gosh, dad, dad I, I can't imagine what he's going through. He never, now we don't have a context of that. We just know that he's on his own working it out. He's 
basically landed in the lowest place of his life, and he's saying, I am not worried to be the father's son anymore, but I would just like to come back and be a servant. That's all I want to do. So it says in verse number 20, and he rose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And so we pick it up here in verse 21 because there's a powerful few words that are said here in verse 24 that are going to highlight really the moving into our message. And the son said unto him, Father, verse number 21, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. And put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Now just think for a minute, real quick. He just wants to be a servant. Servants don't get rings. Servants don't get robes. Servants, servants don't get the fatted calf. He's saying, oh my goodness, what? Father, you don't have to do this. But in his mind, he'd already prepared that the father would just let him back in the house. Verse 24. For this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be married they began to be married in his mind his son was dead and now he says he's alive you talk about hurt you talk about pain you talk about agony. Minute by minute, hour by hour, every day, day after day, agonizing that his son is dead. And yet it says he was alive again. It says that he was lost. And now he's found. I know some families that are hurting over their children. They don't even know where they are. He says that they were lost, but then that child came back, and the father says, I, you were lost, and now you're found. I am so, so happy. What happens to the hurting parent? What happens to parents when they hurt? I wonder sometimes if many parents really have ever faced the hurt that they're going through on a daily basis over different matters for different reasons. Maybe even grandparents and you hurt. You say, what happens to a parent? Well, a lot of times a hurting parent, a parent that's hurting, they end up becoming isolated. They step back, they don't want to be around people, they stop fellowship. A lot of times they go through rejection. They get to a place where they say, I'm rejecting all this stuff that's happened I'm rejecting the matter of my child and what they've done. I, in fact, I'm just going to reject them instead of being in a place of acceptance. I'd just like to have you come home. I'd just like to have you come back. Maybe a parent that's hurting would face anger and anger thing, angerful issues, and they would sin over that. And, and the opposite of that is to have unconditional love toward their child instead of a place of anger where then the hurt is returned with hurt. And the people that hurt and are hurting end up being the people that hurt others. Maybe it's a sense of guilt. It's all my fault. What could I have done better or worse? I, I could have just done something and the guilt builds up. And you say, wait a minute. Forgiveness. Put the regrets down. God's grace has forgiven you. God's goodness has forgiven you. What about despair? Sometimes hurting parents get to a place where they're just in despair. And they have no hope. Where's all the, well, there's no hope. Oh, there's no hope. Maybe some of you today would say, I am that hurting parent. Or I have been that hurting parent. And God has shown me that I can get on the other side of being hurt. See, the word of God has some reality checks for us and it's always beautiful when we see the word of God do that I've, I've got pro found five or six verses here that show us reality and wisdom from the scriptures the first one is from a person and don't forget David understood the condition of a hurting parent we'll look at him in a moment but you see all these old test there's a lot of old testament hurt here a lot of dads a lot of fathers a lot of mothers that went through hurt the families went through hurt and they're hurting 
And so they pen words that are filled with wisdom and, and they really give you a reality check. And one of them is Psalm 34, 18. It says, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Whew. He's right near you. When you are in that place where you think that you're all alone, he'll be with you in the place of your broken heart. I've spoken about this in a, a number of years ago of what God can do. He's nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. He saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. That broken heart leads to a place of a contrite spirit of saying, God, I need you to turn some things around. I'm going to make things right with you. It says in Psalm 38, verse 8, I am feeble and sore broken. Oh my. That could be any one of us. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Have you ever been disquieted in your heart over hurt and pain? Maybe you're a hurting parent today or you've been through that. and you, Gosh, disquieted in your heart, which means it's troubled. There's no calm. There's no stillness. It's never quiet in your heart. In fact, it gets so bad that you start roaring from the inside out. It's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, pain, the heartache. And there's no quiet in your soul, in your heart. Oh my, the psalmist captured that. Psalm 109, verse 22. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. Maybe your heart's wounded inside. You're hurt as a parent. And you're poor and you're needy spiritually speaking. He's saying, oh, I, I just need some nourishment. I, I need some fresh bread from your word. I need, I need some milk from your word. I, I need some fresh honey, some sweet honey. Your word is sweet. My heart is wounded within me. You ever felt as though your heart is wounded, parent? You ever like, oh, gosh, the, oh, my heart. It has wounds in it. Proverbs 17, verse number 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Many of you have heard this one. But a broken spirit, it drieth the bones. Ooh. ooh. That means the spirit speaking, even it affects your, your bones, your hurt, your pain. You actually ache in your body. Because you hurt in your heart. It says in Proverbs 18, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. God says, I'll keep you together in your, your infirmity and your pain and, and the tough, hard times. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? Only God can. If you have an injury on the outside of your body, you're hurting on the outside, you go to 911, go to the doctors. If you're bleeding and you have an injury, you, you go to the doctors. Get some help. You, you have a wound, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? Only the Lord can bear that. You see, even Jesus Christ, when he responded to some of the parents that came to him and said, hey, the Canaanite woman, the Seraphonician woman who had this this child that had devils and spirits in him. You go, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, what happened to my kid? Or even the, the woman that, in Nain, who, the widow who had a son that was gone, she wanted him to be healed. You think for a minute this morning, what it is about having this hurt, parents, and you think, does God understand? Of course he understands. Has God ever walked anybody through the hurting pain, pain uh, the hurting part of being a parent? Oh, yeah. Let's start out with this one first. We're going to just look at a few Old Testament dads. Genesis chapter number four. First one, we've got to start with him, old Adam. Now think about Adam's condition. What, what kind of hurt did Adam go through? Well, first two kids came out. And one of them killed the other. Put yourself in his shoes for a minute. What pain? What pain him and Eve went through? 
How do they handle all that? What do they do? The Bible doesn't go through a long list of lit and the litany of things that they did. We know that he knew his wife in chapter 4. They had Cain and Abel. And, and then they had a competitive problem there. They had a contentious problem there. Cain was jealous of the offering of Abel and he was killed. So Adam, dad, he, he's told by the Lord what to do next. Verse 25 tells me this. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she, excuse me, for God said she, hath appointed me another seed of Abel whom Cain slew. Okay, Adam and Eve, you're going to have another child. Adam and Eve, we have to continue together. This is God. He says in verse 26, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Clearly God is saying something here. And I'm, I'm not saying it uh, tritely. Or God's saying, look, I've got my will to carry out. And I want you in on my will. So the next thing that has to happen is there has to be another child that's born of you. Another seed of you, Adam and Eve. I've, I've been appointed another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. Okay, so are we not supposed to mourn on that child that we lost? Yes. Are we supposed to stop functioning? No. You see, in the midst of the hurting parenting that's going on between Adam and Eve, God says, I've appointed more to you. I have made an appointment here. And his name is Seth. Because God said, hey, instead of Abel, I give you someone else. That's powerful. It doesn't mean God discounts the child that was there before. It just means God says, I'm going to do more. Then we have Abraham. Go to Genesis 21. We have this Abraham guy, Father Abraham. We've talked about him a little bit in our Galatians study. He's in there. He appears quite a bit. Father Abraham and many sons. He's really, truly the Old Testament preview of Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ, we gain that Father Abraham, Father Lord God relationship in Jesus Christ. And we land in chapter number 21 and we think about Abraham's life. Abraham and Sarah, they're, they're, they're told by God they're going to have a child. <laughs> Wait a minute, what, what, child? What are you talking about? The herd of parents before they're even being parents are, are like going, what are we going to do? How are we going to have a child? And then, of course, we know that Sarai says, hey, Sarah says, Hagar, go into my husband. Husband takes her. There's a child born. We pick it up in verse number 9, and we see in Genesis 21, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Now he's being weaned. He's a few years old now. So guess what? There's 14 years difference between these two children, plus the years, the three years of them being weaned. So now three, three four, five years later, now we have this whole scenario here where she said unto Abraham, cast out that bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous to Abraham's sight because of his son. This is my son. This is my son. And you're telling me what? That I need to get him out and get the mother of my son Ishmael out? Yes, I am telling you that. In fact, God makes it clear in verse 12. God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of thy lad and because of thy bondwoman. And in that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So what she's saying is right on the money. It's according to God's will. Follow what she's saying. I'm speaking through your wife, and this is what you're supposed to do. So what happens? Verse 13 and 14. And also the son of the bondwoman, will I make a nation? Don't worry about him because he is thy seed. Verse 14. Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar. So he gets a little bit of nourishment for his concubine, Hagar, and for Ishmael and says, okay, here you go. I'm going to send you away. So, bread, water, put it on his shoulder, said to the child and her, 
go. How about hurting parent there? She departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Okay, hurting parent number two tells us that Abraham and I, excuse me, Abraham and Sarah, they're about to have another child. It's going to be Isaac, but Ishmael, as father, you just send him out. Whoa. What's it like for that hurting parent? Here's Jacob, Genesis 37. Here's Jacob. Genesis chapter number 37. You know Jacob a little bit here. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He's the one who supplanted his brother, and he gets the blessing. He has now got the birthright. And Jacob, okay, what about him and being a parent? Well, Jacob has lots of kids. He really loves Rachel, but he has to have Leah. And that's how God rearranges it, through the agreement of dad. But then he has a child by the name of Joseph. And the Bible teaches us that he loved Joseph more than the others. Why? Because it says he loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. That is Genesis 37, 3. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when the brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So wow. Father Jacob loves his son, Joseph, more than any others. Yet... They hate his son Joseph. The brothers do. Of course, as things get unfolded and he dreams a dream, he gives the, of course, interpretation of the dream. The brothers even hate him some more. And of course, they now are going wandering in the field and say, hey, let's just take jo Joseph and we're going to get rid of him. So that's how the story goes. That's, of course, a Reader's Digest version. We pick it up in verse number 29 and we see how this thing's going. They're kind of getting rid of him. They're selling him off. And they put him away. And Re Reuben returns into the pit, verse 29. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit. He rent his clothes because he thinks he's dead. He returned to his brother and said, The child is not, and whither I shall go? And they took Joseph's coat and they killed a kid of the goats. They dipped the, blood, uh, the coat in blood and they sent the coat of many colors. They brought it to their father. And now here's Jacob. He's thinking, oh no, oh my, what kind of news do you have for me? And of course, they, they set up Jacob. They play the trick that they do on their dad. This we have found. No, now, whether it be the, my son's coat or not, and he, said, and he knew it, and he said, it is my. It is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. So he thinks his son is dead. What happens at verse 34? Jacob rent his clothes, he put sackcloth upon his loins, he mourned his son many days, and all his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him. What does it say? He refused to be comforted. He then says, I'll go in the grave, I'm mourning so much, I'll go in the grave where my son is. Hey everybody. A hurting parent may not want to be comforted. A hurting parent may be grieving so much that they just figure life is over as they know it, and they'll go into the grave. You see, there's a lot of hurting parents that agonize over their children. Is there any hope? It says in verse 34, his father wept for him, and he wept, and he wept, and he mourned. Jacob, Adam, Abraham, all hurting. What about Eli real quick? First Samuel chapter number 2. We'll be looking at 1 Samuel 2 here in a minute. As we have our baby dedication for the good stuff. But 1 Samuel chapter number 2, when we see the story of Eli as a father and how he's a priest and he has these two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. And they're not good kids. And they turn out not to be good. In verse number 12 of 1 Samuel 2, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not God. That means that they are of the devil. <laughs> the priest's custom where the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, a priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with the flesh book of teeth in their hand, and he struck it into the pan or the kettle. They were part of how people would bring their offerings to have the priest take care of it, and these sons were to act as servants for dad, as the priest. How did that go? Well, it says in verse number 17, Wherefore the sin of the young man was so very great before the Lord, for men had hoard the offering of the Lord. They said, we don't even want to be part of what's going on because these two brothers, 
who are the priest's kids, are so bad. How about Eli being a hurting dad, being aware of all this, and even the Bible says he didn't do anything about it. And it goes down in verse number 27, and we see that, hey, there came a man of God unto Eli and said, hey, thus saith the Lord, I plainly, did I plainly appear unto the house of the father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of the tribes of Israel to be my priest? He goes on to, hey, don't you realize what I put in place here? Hey, Eli, you're supposed to follow my way of doing things. It says in verse number 33, and the man of mine, thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. Wow, how would you like to hear that? About your own children. Here's a priest. He says in verse number 35, I'll raise up, me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart. Of course, he raises up Samuel. You see, the hurting parent, one like Eli, he's being told that his two sons are going to die. And then we see in the Bible in chapter number four, if you turn there to chapter number four, just to pull Eli's story together, the ark of God 1 Samuel 4, verse number 11. The ark of God was taken. The two sons of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army. Came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with his earth upon his head. He came to tell Eli because the Philistines had taken. They actually took and defeated Israel. God allowed this all to happen. The ark was taken. Now the presence and power of God is not with Israel. And you're talking about a priest named Eli, the hurting parent over two children, that he finds out, that he finds out here, as you go down a little bit further, and we see, verse number 17, the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter, and the two sons, also Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And if you see 1 Samuel 4, 18, what happens to Eli, it says that he fell, broke his neck, and he was dead. The hurting parent, hurting over the news, being told by the messenger of God that his sons were going to be dealt with, <clears throat> and they were going to die. And how does it come out? Even Eli dies. See, God is straight. God is righteous. God is just. But we have to allow him to bring his justness his righteousness we need to set things up in a place where as we pray we let God do his way and do his thing and so we've got to check in with our old friend King David go to 2 Samuel 12 just for a moment and so we've got Adam Abraham Jacob Eli and now we have David King David King David who is a dad boy he had his troubles he had his heartaches he had his difficulties And of course, in the beginning of chapter number 12 of 2 Samuel, we see what happens with the sin of David and how it's being revealed. And then the prophet Nathan, in verse number 10, brings the message from God of the judgment upon his life and everything. We preached about this last year. We realized that nothing is beyond God's grace, but David had a mess on his hands because of his sin. And it says in verse number 13 of chapter number 12, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. And that's the mercy of God. But what's going to happen in the meantime is David becomes a hurting parent. As we've walked through that and seen that again in our study in 2 Samuel last year, it bears being reminded as in verse number 19 of chapter 12. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. The child that was born to him from Bathsheba, out of the sin that they had, God said, I'm taking that child. It's crazy because we see Father David. Just a little bit further down. Verse number 23. But now he is dead, 
Wherefore should I fast? Because the servants around him are wondering, why is he acting like he is? He's been mourning and he's been broken over the child and what may or may not happen. He's been calling out to the Lord. Now the child has been taken by God. He says, but he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back? No, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. One day I'll see him in glory because of God's promise to have that baby in glory. How do you handle the hurt? How do you handle the pain of losing a child? How do you handle the hurt, parent, of having just a broken relationship, how your child may sway spiritually, or they're just having a tough time with life? Well, David's life, even in chapter number 13 of 2 Samuel, he sees his daughter Tamar, and she is raped by her half-brother, Amnon. He says in verse number 20 that he was very wroth. He was, verse 21 in chapter 13, but when King David heard of these things, he was very wroth. It's up on the screen. He was angry, but he didn't do anything about it. He didn't bring him before the court to have justice done. David was angry, but he didn't do any more than that. And then, of course, we know what happened beyond that. His son Absalom said, I'll take things into my own hands. And so Absalom takes things into his own hands. And he makes sure he sets things up, and he makes sure to take the life of his brother, Amnon. And as you see that, you go, whoa, what happened there? Well, then David says, I can't take it anymore. What happened? He tears his garments, and he lays them on earth. Chapter number 13, verse number 31, when he finds out that Amnon is gone. He finds out that, what, later that Absalom has taken his brother's life. But it even goes further. When you find out later in the chapter of 2 Samuel 13 that Joab then deals with Absalom. And you're reminded of King David's life. Of King David and his suffering and his hurting as a parent. Boy, did he hurt. What is it like to be a hurting parent? Many of you in the room, I won't say all, because maybe not all of you have been hurting or have hurt over your children, but you get to a point where you're thinking, how do I respond to all this? What do I do? I need to just straighten this thing out. I can't take it anymore. I, I, David, how much more can he take? Why didn't David just do something about everything? Why didn't he stop all the murdering? Why didn't he stop all the bad stuff? Why, didn't, why wasn't Adam there to stop Cain from killing Abel? See, sometimes hurting parents think that they can undo the choices of their children. Sometimes we think that we as shepherds can undo the choices. And God says choices sometimes have to pay, be played out. I could follow the scriptures and see it. But sometimes God says, I'm going to intervene. In fact, God usually, most of the time I see the accountings of things, says, hey, I'll show you the right way to go. I'll show you the wrong way to go. You still have free will to choose. You still have free will. Believer, you have a choice. You know what the Word of God says? What are the wrong responses? Spend a couple minutes here and think about what could be your wrong responses? Because we could respond wrongly. You see, having a wayward child hurts. It's beyond hurt. The parent, they ache. The wound is deep. And, and you, can't, you can't describe it. But then there's God's grace. It's right there. God's grace. It's always there. You say, I'm just getting by one day at a time. How about you and I really tapping in? to the beautiful ointment of God that brings salve to the wounds that are ripping us apart instead of seeing salt poured on wounds that hurt. You see, parenting does hurt, but God will bring salve to your heart and to your soul and to your spirit and your brokenness. And when your bones ache, he'll say, I'll take care of you. Be careful that you don't go after things and make the wrong response because just look up on the screen. Sometimes we want to take control of things. That's not the right response. In fact, that's a wrong response. I'm going to take control. In painful moments, sometimes parents just, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to fix this thing. I'm going to take control of it. We try to maintain some, some 
mythological strangle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a hold of this thing, and I've got the authority, and I'll. And God is just saying, I'm in control. A lot of times when we want to take control, it escalates things. It makes things worse. We overreact with emotions, and we continue to be reactionary over the next move and the next move of our children. Reactionary things just don't become a place where God can work. Resignation. Maybe you then flip to the complete other side. Well, <laughs> I've done all that I can. I can't do any more. Well, then I just resign myself to the fact that things are just going to be awful. You failed. I failed. The kids have failed. Then mentally and emotionally, you just go, oh, well. That's not a good response to a child that's brought hurt to you. But we've all got to a place where we overreacted or got to a place where we flipped the opposite way and said, hey, I resign myself to the fact that, oh, well, if you're not going to do anything that I told you to do, I just resign myself to the fact that I ought not to be in the place of discouragement either, to discourage everyone around me, just talk about things. See, discouragement becomes overwhelming. When you get discouraged, the enemy has a way of getting in there and going, <laughs> God can't do anything. See, you couldn't do anything. You're still hurting, aren't you? God hasn't done anything for you. And you become more discouraged and more heavy. And you be, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't see that. Adam did what, excuse me, Abraham did what God told him to do. Jacob did what God told him to do. He hung on, and years later, he found out Joseph was alive. Woo! Hallelujah. Hurting? Discouraged a little bit, yes, but he didn't live there. He didn't stay there. Because one of the worst things that can happen is you end up having that anger response. I'll have that anger response. And when I become a, in a place of angerfulness, whew, I decide, I mentioned it earlier, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Anger is a, it's a tough one. That would not be the right response when you're hurting as a parent. One of the worst things that you and I can do when we're in the midst of a crisis, especially with our children, is to then make some life-changing decisions. Not a good thing to do emotionally. So let's end with some really good stuff here. What about some right responses? Are there any right responses? Well, throughout the Word of God, there are. There's tons of them. And what I'm giving you is just a place of just sitting there and going, wait a minute. I have to understand that there's a temporary loss, but it doesn't mean that things have completely failed. Things are temporarily not good. But this is not a permanent failure. There are right responses in this place. And most of all, it's for you and me to rest in the Lord. To say that the story is still continuing. Please God. Please God. Please God. Even if the outcome isn't the one you wanted, you just say, please God. Have my heart in a place where I can receive your grace and then I can act on your grace. Please Lord God. I don't want to be in a place where I had to have everything quantified and qualified. It has to be this way. And I did this this week and it didn't work. So I'm, I'm not going to do anymore. That's not the right way to go. The right response is for you and I to decide we're not in control. You need to accept and I need to accept that we are not in control. Oh, really? That's hard for people. Everyone in this room could probably say there's... Much of my life I've learned where I love to be in control. Love to be in control of everything that I do. Well, you may be in control of your free will to make decisions, but God is overseeing everything. And ultimately, God's in control. God's in control of all that you see and look around. You do not have control. You won't have control. You can't have control. An adult's an adult. We're not gods. We're, we're not God. You see, prodigals have a way of thinking, I'm in control now. I'll fix you, parents. Whew. 
Now we push back and forth because they're expecting us to push back and forth. But when you let go of that thing and there's no longer a power struggle, you might give that child, you're hurting over them, but you might give that child like, oh my goodness, my parents don't care. No, they care. They're just tired of the power struggle. You say, does that mean that you just don't care about your children? I did not say that. I said, there's other places where you can do the things that you're supposed to do and I'm supposed to do the things I'm supposed to do. A young adult stands squarely in the midst of being accountable to God and God alone. There is a much higher accountability than just you. You say, well, I should have done something. I could have done something. Well, that's number two. You need to repent, and I need to repent of the wounds that I've created and the resentment that I may have generated. See, sometimes you and I just need to look at ourselves and go, wait a minute, time for a little inventory of my spiritual life. Time for a little inventory, special, special time here, personal evaluation with the Lord, opening up the Word of God, reading through Psalm 31, Psalm 34, Psalm 103, Psalm 107, looking at some of the Psalms, Psalm 41, Psalm 40, Psalm 42, looking at this personal, looking at Psalm 51, against thee and thee alone have I sinned, and realize something that there may be sin in my life that I had done and it created wounds in my child. Or if there is a wound or something that was created to you in your childhood and you built something up and now this has triggered it, now it's become generationally perpetual. I need to repent of it and put it down and say, okay, son, daughter, please forgive me. If you give me a chance, I'll tell you that I did not go about things the way I thought. I, I thought I was doing what's right, but I found out from the Lord that I, I, can you just forgive me? And they may not. But a part of the way that the rebellion works for a prodigal and them even having a chance to return is this. We have to be right before the Lord. We have to not be placed, put a place where we have resentment, we built it up in our own lives and then we cause it upon the other or we have wounds that we keep on regurgitating and keep on repeating and do you know what you did to me? Do you know what you did to me? Do you know what you did to me? After a while, you and I just need to just say, I need to put it down and forgive. You know the human nature thing is if I perceive that you've hurt me, I need to work it through. And that child that's running away or walking away or when you're hurting as a parent, you're going, I can't even think clearly about things. That's why God's saying, hey, be kind one to another, tender heart or forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. We always say that to the children. But we don't let God say that to, our, to us. And then lastly, we need to formulate a gracious response. We need to learn how to respond graciously. This is very, very important here. You need to respond with grace. Prodigals, they're expecting you to punch them back. Boom. When you're able to say grace. The same grace that saved our souls is the same grace that's going to take us through. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. This will surprise that person. But guess what? Guess what? When you respond as a compassionate person, everything that they were building up against you, everything that was the issue and the difficulty has now been blown up. It's kind of like it's been undone. And that grace that God pours out, putting God's child in God's hands to deal with him the way he says, it frees you to just give grace. Is there anything wrong with ministering grace? What, what is it that we think that we're going to mete out grace because it has to be something that is earned? Well, that's not grace. That's your works-based, duty-filled, works-dependent stuff. Well, I'll do this if you do that. Oh, it'll make the hurt even worse. A prodigal son came back to a father who was waiting with open arms. Why could we not be that beautiful uh, good Samaritan that we talked about in our break time yesterday with the kids where we can just see that there's a person on the side of the road. It's your child and they're hurting and they got wounds and they just need to be bound up and put back on the road. Maybe that's all they need. Where's the grace? Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they've done. Not what they did. Think about Grace. In God's grace and formulate a gracious response. So parents, I ask you as we finish up, 
What are your spiritual weapons in the battle against hurt? Because hurt comes. You think about that battle. It's a battle. What are the Holy Spirit weapons that you have in that battle against the hurt? I hope you can look at this verse up on the screen and say, hey, yeah, 2 Corinthians 12 keeps on coming back to me. It keeps on reminding me of how as a parent who is hurting what I need to lean on. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Grace, grace. Parents, what are your spiritual weapons in the war against hurt? Maybe you're a hurting parent this morning. And before we have our baby dedication time, maybe it's just good for us parents to have a little bit of time to pray with the Lord. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. I thank you, Father, for your word. It's precious and it's powerful and it's true. And as we looked at all those different examples in the Old Testament of fathers that were hurting completely hurting from all the things that had happened with their children. God, you sustained and showed us in the word of God how you can allow us and show us how to formulate a gracious response, how we're reminded that we are not in control and that God, our Father, we need to repent of some of the stuff that we have, the wounds and resentment that build up in our lives. I pray this morning in our time of invitation, please, God, have your way in our hearts in Jesus' name. Please stand as the song plays, as our, as our song is playing already. Please come and do business with the Lord. Maybe you'll do business in the seat that you're sitting in. Maybe it's just time for you to take a little time with the Lord. Please come.